Okay, so uh, I did see your panel discussion uh, that just preceded my talk. It was an excellent panel discussion, and honestly, it's a nice setup for what I'm about to talk about. These these are my disclosures. So the, yes, the title is The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly of Spinal Robotics comes from, of course, the famous uh, Clint Eastwood movie that certainly all of us have seen. And when we talk about any technology, there's uh, the technology adoption curve, classic uh, um, uh, kind of presentation. And I think it's important for us all to remember that we're still in, in the ver very early stages of spinal robots, uh, still in the early adopter phase. So, so, so lots, of lots to come there. There's also something out there called the Gartner hype cycle which applies to any new technology. This, this curve gets repeated when new things appear. And, and I'd also argue that uh, we're at the, the, the kind of the top of the hype cycle with spinal robots right now. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. So what are the good aspects of spinal robots? Well, with lots of reports of uh, increased accuracy, right? Um, reports of such things as decreased violation of the adjacent facets when you're placing pedicle screws, certainly reduction of radiation exposure and uh, integration with surgical planning software. Those are good. I, I would argue that the vast majority, if not all of those attributes actually belong to image guidance uh, and uh, robotics takes advantage of that. So again, uh, publications showing that, uh, boy, the robots are more accurate uh, when placing pedicle screws than, than performing the same task freehand. Uh, significantly less radiation uh, than if you're using uh, fluoroscopy to, to place your screws, but uh, typically significantly longer surgical times. At least that's what our literature reflects. And then on, on to the bad, you know, again, we're in the early phases of spinal robots. Uh, you know, Izzy talked about that. There, there's lots of technology out there that, that will improve what we're doing. But for now, you know, we've, we've got these big chunks of metal uh, in the OR. They're, they're large, they're complex, and they're expensive. And, and uh, Pat, I think you said this, they're pointing devices, right? That's, that's what they do currently. So they require a high degree of capital investment, which doesn't make them ASC friendly. Uh, large footprints, as we talked about, they can distract the surgeon from the patient. They may not be well integrated into the surgical workflow, although we heard a variety of opinions and experiences with that in the uh, the panel discussion that preceded my talk. So clearly there, there are people figuring this out and, and people still struggling. Uh, there are long learning curves uh, in, in image guidance in general. There are line of sight issues between our trackers and uh, and and the, the markers that are on our instruments. And this was also mentioned in the uh, the panel discussion. Typically, these systems are tied to specific implants. So even if you're facile and comfortable with another implant, if you want to use a particular robot right now, you, you're asked to switch. That may or may not be ideal. So we, we we tout accuracy with these things, but you know, so I I love image guidance. You know, I'm I'm the guy who developed spinal stealth decades ago, and uh, you know, the, you all know the term uh, virtual reality, but I, I also use the term virtual facade. And uh, one of the limitations of image guidance is that you can be off, and you have this compelling picture. Uh, this virtual picture of the anatomy, but it's not real. And you end up doing something like you see uh, on that right-handed slide. This is a case that Juan Uribe posted. I, I happen to know it comes from a major uh, university in the Midwest United States, but it, it can happen to anyone. That's a phase shift. And there those screws are you know, nicely arrayed, just way off target. This is... Other data that, that Juan has published uh, looking at 
the Barrow experience as they began to use robots. And here he's questioning the learning curve, saying, wait a minute, guys, this, this is the learning line. We've got a flat line here. We're, we're, we're not getting better and faster with time. So I'd say that's a challenge for robotics. And this, this reflects something very similar that, uh, you know, the, the workflow, at least over their early few months experience of the Barrow, which they were tracking, didn't seem to be improving. I, th I think that's improved over time, by the way. So what do we need going forward? I mean, we're all uh, enthused about the technology. But it's going to, to continue to improve. It's, it's going to continue to, uh, to, to, to get better. But these things need to be easier to use. They've got to become more favorable economically. Uh, of course, we need faster, more efficient workflows. That they they need to make us faster, and, and clearly the value, the clinical value, has got to improve. So, what would I like in a perfect world with spine robots? Uh, you, this was a, one of the questions during the panel discussion. I think they need to make difficult surgical tasks simpler and more reproducible. Of course, they need to reduce radiation. Uh, one can argue they already do that. They need to provide accuracy out of the box without a difficult learning curve. They need to integrate with all kinds of navigation, you know, not, not just three-dimensional CT scans. They need to enhance our efficiency, make us faster, make us better. I think they should be implant agnostic. Um, you, know, you should be able to use the implants you, you like and, and that work in your hands. I think they need to be portable. Uh, there, there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to move these things easily from OR to OR, from the OR to the ASC, or even to different institutions. They've got to enable other tasks besides uh, screw guidance. Yeah, right now, they're pointing devices, and they, they, they hold your trajectory uh, as, as you, the surgeon, place the screw. This has been well covered this morning. Um, you know, if, we, if you look at what our general surgical colleagues have done uh, in robotics. I mean, it's, it's been transformative. And one of the things, this was mentioned also in the panel discussion, one of the, one of the huge appeals I can tell you is to older general surgeons doing delicate microsurgical tasks. You know, it, it's, it's well known and off patent, by the way, that uh, you, you can put tremor filters in, in, uh, in robots. And those of you who haven't used a, a robot with a tremor filter may not know this, but you can't feel the tremor filter. You think, well, that's going to make, I'm, I'm going to lose my feel. This is not going to, when I move, it's going to be you know, clunky, so to speak. You know, human, human tremor is right around five to seven hertz. And if you put a band, uh, bandwidth uh, uh, filter in there so that you simply can't pass through that five to seven hertz frequency, it doesn't affect your motion at all. It's just, there is no tremor. And you can do things like unweight devices. So you know, if you're holding onto something that, that's quite heavy, we, we all know how repetitive tasks in the OR can become fatiguing, especially in long cases. But the robots can fix all of that. And, and, and that technology, as Izzy said, all exists. We, we just need to demand that it be incorporated into these devices. And ultimately, gang, this, we, these things have to provide value. You know, we're, we're in a, an environment where you know, we can't, it's unsustainable to continue to spend the kinds of dollars we are in healthcare. We've, we, all through healthcare, values got to improve. We're, we're all aware. So this is uh, from the movie Passengers. Uh, it was out a couple of years ago, starred uh, Jennifer Lawrence and Chris Pratt. They're stuck on a spacecraft. Jennifer Lawrence has got to do this complex resuscitation of Chris Pratt. She had no medical training. So out comes Autodoc, right? So you're probably aware I've, I've worked on, 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 you know, in the field trying to, to address some of the challenges. Um, this device uh, was, was, was recently purchased by ATEC. Uh, that's my disclosure. It was developed independently by uh, a team that I was that I was part of, um, and we were trying to address the portability issue, the cost issue, and and the efficiency issue with the current pointing devices. Incorporated some other things that I think are interesting. You know, the tracking cameras are getting smaller. Um, 
uh, th there's some other things you can add. Uh, the, the, this thing has accelerometers in the camera too, as you can tell if someone bumped the camera, you can actually track the tracker. Um, but it, 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 I, I think it's it's nice to to, to have the tracker closer uh, to to your 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 targets and also out of the way so people can crowd around the OR table and there aren't line of sight issues, at least they're minimized. Um, there are some interesting things you can do with software too. So what I'm doing here is I'm spinning the array. And if you look at the, uh, the screen behind me, I'll, I'll run that video again. Notice that the image isn't jumping around. I, I dare you to do this with any other system out there that's an image guided system. If you if you do this, um, you will see that image jump, and that's because of what happens with the incident angle of light on these tracker spheres. The spheres aren't quite spherical. I don't know if you guys know that, and so the centroid of these spheres is tracked, and it moves when you move the spheres. So, and this has nothing to do with moving the DRA or moving the camera, but it, the inaccuracy can be substantial. That's, this is one of the causes of phase shift, by the way, phase shift and accuracy and image guidance. And it's something that, that it can be eliminated, but it needs some engineering to do so. And then, you know, setup needs to be fast. Um, I like to not have to prep and drape the patient and, and then get spins and like, so this is engineered to be able to, 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 get all this stuff done before you, the patient's sterile. And uh, otherwise you can bump the sterile field and you have to redrape. And I, I think that's a potential pain point. Planning can be simplified. I won't dwell on this. Uh, and then the pointer device, right? So yeah, we, we all know we, we, we can play screws like this. I just think we need to do it faster, cheaper, better. And yeah, an example. So we actually did a, a study. Uh, the senior author on this was John Polina. This is published in the journal Curious. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the group up at Buffalo, uh, very experienced with one of the large robots and had never seen the, the portable one before. And so we set up a study, which was to look at placing four screws. So just to, you know, a single level fusion. Uh, but the notion was to time the task from uh, uh, interoperative planning to screws in and had an independent observer uh, doing the timing, timing all the tasks. And to, to make a long story short, uh, it, we, we scanned afterwards, looked at accuracy. What we found is we could, both systems were quite accurate. But the, the the portable system was a lot faster. It just shows you what's possible. So if, if you break down and you look at you know overall speed, this was total time to to, to four screws in. Uh, so around 36 minutes with the portable system, you know close to an hour with the bigger system. So clearly faster. And if you if you can look at the graph, uh, the bar graph to the bottom left, where was it faster? Well, it was a lot easier to set up. Um, and, uh, it was just plain faster from planning to screws in position. Um, the, the, the other components were, 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 were relatively, uh, similar in timing. And this just goes to show that you can get these systems to be more efficient. There's, there's, there's no reason we shouldn't demand that. And then, you know, there's the whole system. So this one is set up so that you can use a, you know, a big touch screen on a stand in your, or you can use a laptop. So you're, this is with the laptop system. Uh, that's Brad Clayton on the, on the right. Some of you know, I mean, he was one of my partners in, in this endeavor. And that I, I took a picture of him one day. We, were, we had brought the, the system out to Esmus and this is in the Vegas airport. And I said, Hey, Brad, I got to get a picture of this. Cause he had all his stuff for the weekend and one side of his uh, carry on. That's the whole robot system and the other side of his carry on. So in conclusion, we're in the early stages of spinal robotic development and adoption. These systems need to be, as many people have said this morning, much more than million dollar aiming devices. Near-term targets for improvement include affordability and workflow efficiency. Longer term, uh, we need to adapt these robots to perform or enhance other surgical tasks, such as decompression. And in the long run, new spinal technologies that are accurate, affordable, efficient, and enhance surgical outcomes will win. Thank you very much.
Kevin, thank you very much for bringing us up to speed with uh, new technology, which I, I think is so incredibly needed uh, in this space. Um, I don't know, you, you have more tricks up your sleeve because you're, you're making something, you know, that is competing with the big boys. And, and, you know, you heard our panel session. Do you have any ideas for the future or are you not able to tell us about those? Well, I, of course I have ideas, Pat. But I, and I think, and, I, and Izzy, I look, at lot, lots of you guys have ideas. The, uh, I, I think the, the, what we need to do is pretty straightforward, right? And, and what's interesting, and Izzy said this, well, a lot of the stuff's already out there. You know, we, you know, as a community, we, I don't think we've been vocal enough. I, I, we, we need to, to demand these things. I don't, it, 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 I'd ask Izzy to make a few comments here. He's been at this a long time. Izzy, you have a microphone? Okay. Okay. Good to see you, Kevin, and thank you for contributing. And yes, um, I always have comments, but not to be repetitive of what you're saying. You're saying all the same things that I've been saying. It, we, we need... Yep to be vocal and move the needle. We've not moved the needle. As long as you and I have been at this right now, we're still using the same thing. I mentioned this earlier, I don't know if, if you were on, but why are we still using the same navigation technology that's 50 years old at this point? There's so much better navigation technology out there. We should be adopting that. We should be incorporating that now, which will, make it even faster, more efficient, more portable, all the things that you're advocating for.